Hi, my name is Joe Ricards, and I'm here with a very special guest today, Barry McGuire. Barry is a lawyer, is a partner in a law firm in Edmonton, Alberta, and he's been practicing law for 37 years. And then he's been specializing in real estate law for 27 years. Now, one of the many things I love about Barry is that he's not a typical average, you know, conservative type lawyer in the box, not at all. He's a published author and he's a sought after speaker on real estate law and real estate investing across Canada. Now, what makes Barry particularly invaluable to us real estate investors is that he's not only a real estate lawyer, but he's in the trenches as a real estate investor as well for 37 years. First question, you know, some real estate investors are successful, some not so successful. What would you say you've seen in your days, you know, you've seen that you would define as the secret to success? The first thing is they educate themselves. They educate themselves uh, with Canadian, real, suitable, practical education. They don't take a zillion American courses, which are good in their way, and we've all taken them, and there's some, there's some bonuses in there, but they educate themselves. You have to understand real estate. It's a complicated business. The second thing they do is they develop a plan to succeed in real estate and, along with some goals. Planning and goal setting kind of fit together. A plan and a goal. And the third thing they do is they all have a great team. You can't do it on your own. You need a great team to support you. Team does what they do. You do what you do. And so it's education, planning, goal setting, and team. Great advice. I couldn't agree more. One thing I just uh, to add in, if I may, what, what about action because I've taken tons of courses most of them US courses and I think I remember one mentor of mine taught me years ago learners are earners and I've always I'm always learning I'm always a student yes. first and so I've noticed a lot of the same faces in the courses that I'm taking but I'm talking to them they're not doing real estate so while education is phenomenal where would you put action in the formula of success well sooner or later you have to take some action Mm -hmm. The people that, that you just mentioned, that you're talking about, that's analysis paralysis. They take so many courses, they slice and dice the information, they try and fit it into whatever strategy they think they might implement, and in the end, they don't do anything. Mm -hmm. So sooner or later, you have to take action. You have to buy that first property, which is difficult. If you cast your mind back buying your first property, you bought a lot, but there was a first property. I can remember my first property. It was tough. It was scary. Scary. Mm -hmm. Scared the heck out of me. Mm -hmm. Number two was half as hard. And by the time you get to number three, then you understand the process and you're more on to the negotiation. But you have to take action. I, I completely concur. I remember the study of Dr. Amen. He's in LA. And he, he does uh, brain mapping. And he's got tens of thousands of actual brain scans mapping. And what he actually proved scientifically is that taking action and doing whatever it is you're, that you're looking at doing, actually reprograms your neural pathways. Like it, it, it changes the way the, the neurons fire in your neural path pathways and it literally reprograms and it makes it easier for you the next time. Which we, we all know practically speaking, but it's now scientifically proven. So that's kind of cool and shows us how important action is. I, I totally agree. And if, it, if, if that's what it's doing, then great. So Barry, I'd like to delve into kind of a secret area, if I may of creative, uh, doing creative deals. Um, and that is a big obstacle that's come up to tr when one is trying to do a skip transfer deal in recent years. It used to be that you'd do a skip transfer and it would just be the solicitors would, would um, look after the contractual relationships between the three par parties in a skip transfer deal. And it would all be fine. It would all go through and the banks would fund and it was all good. Now, it seems like as part of the underwriting process, a lot of institutions, the underwriters, underwriters themselves are pulling title and they're seeing that Mr. Seller that's on the contract to purchase and sale is not the title owner. And they're going, wait a second, what's going on here? Some skullduggery going on or what's, you know, it's just outside their box, their policy. And then they call the solicitor and ask what's going on. He says, oh, it's just a skip transfer transaction. And oh, they typically I see come back with, oh, we don't do flips. And then they pull the plug. And the worst part of it all is that they tend, this tends to happen as a final check before the transaction goes through, which means a couple days before closing or a week tops, and, and now you've got a breach of contract, you've got people moving, you've got a problem, you've got a mess here. And so 
you came up with a brilliant uh, strategy or technique, I guess we'd call it, that you introduced to me, and I had not seen that before, and I greatly appreciate that, by the way. Welcome. I had done it a different way and still do it a, a di little bit different spin on that, which also works. And we used your technique, it worked great. So maybe could you enlighten us on explaining that technique and how it works and uh, a little bit about that. Okay. So what, what we did on this, on this last transaction, and it should work with any transaction where you as a buyer can um, work with the seller to get control of a property. You need to get control of a property using any one of the number of techniques that you can do. But in your contract with your seller, what you do is you, you obligate him as the seller and as the person whose name is on the title, you obligate him to sign contracts with the ultimate buyers. So that when underwriters or title insurance people look at the title, they will see that the name on the contract and the name on the title are the same name. Exactly. So what we also did in there is that we uh, have made sure on a full disclosure basis that the seller knows that you're going to market properties to other buyers and that you're going to actually make some money doing it. Mm -hmm. So we also say to the seller that when the price comes in from the ultimate buyer, you get to pay the seller what you agreed to pay him per door and you get the difference between the price to the ultimate buyer and the price to the current owner. So we, we organize it so that he understands you're making some money and he agrees that in the sale process, he will get his chunk of money and you will get your chunk of money and everyone's protected. So it's, it's working nicely. It is, it is. Now I'd ask you, you know, there's always naysayers out there and doomsdayers. Uh, there's always those types out there. So if somebody said to you, I don't know, Barry, that uh, technique sounds like conspiring to commit mortgage fraud, what would you say to them? Well, I'd say that mortgage fraud always involves uh, concealing something from the lender. So even though we've set up the transaction in a different way, I think the key difference is, is that we advise everybody we touch to fully disclose everything uh, to whoever they're working with on the transaction. Um, there are disclosure materials that are done in great detail that, it, that explains every facet of the transaction so that there really isn't anything that anybody could want to know about how the deal is going that isn't either in the disclosure book or available if questions are asked. So if it's, if it's fully disclosed and fully transparent and nothing is hidden away, then it isn't mortgage fraud. Full disclosure. Full Bottom disclosure. Line. That's right. Thanks for explaining that. Now, for educational purposes, I find because it's quite a confusing topic out there in the creative real estate world, what, that's not mortgage fraud. Why don't we talk about what is mortgage fraud? And, and in my experience in the trenches for 18 years, I've seen a lot, and it seems to be the predominant way that, it, that I've seen it committed, is that people will do a credit back on an extra addendum or you know, a $20,000, let's say, um, rebate, credit back, whatever you want to call it. What they do is either the investor doesn't send it to the mortgage broker or the mortgage broker doesn't send it to the bank. It's just, oops, you know, it didn't go through and they hide it. Again, down yeah. to the, like you're saying, concealing it. That is a material fact to the deal that's not, uh, not, not given to the bank. And that's clearly, right, mortgage fraud. That, that, is, that is clearly an example of mortgage fraud. And you put your finger right on it because something has been concealed from the bank. The fact that the seller is giving the buyer back $20,000 that the bank doesn't know about is something that if the bank did know about it, well, they wouldn't do that deal. Yeah. So you're hiding something and always mortgage fraud involves hiding something. Exactly. So if, if you're learning from somebody and they're trying to teach you to hide something, I mean, the, the flag's got to go up and don't walk, but run away, right? That's you right. You don't need you, to do as that. Soon as, as soon as you hear somebody say, you can't tell exactly. whoever exactly. something, Send the red yeah. flag up the, the pole. The flag is up and, and yeah. run away. You exactly. have to run if you, if you ever hear that. Exactly. We want to clean up the reputation to no money down in the creative world. And that's, and that's how to do it. And just to explain, Barry, why I'm asking you about the, the mortgage fraud is because the whole no money down is near and dear to my heart. And, and it, it's such a confused, I, I find it the, the number one most confused tactic or strategy out there is no money down. And what's mortgage fraud? What isn't? Most investors are confused about that. And that's people that have learned, let alone the professionals, the realtors and what have you. So 
just to explain where I'm coming from, just so you know, when I first got started, I, I took a No Money Down course with Raymond Aaron, actually. Yeah, with Raymond Aaron. I've spoken at Raymond's events. Right, yes. right. Well, isn't that funny how things go full yeah. circle, right? And now we're sitting here together, and he's, a, he's the man that I thank for getting me. He whet my appetite to know that No Money Down is possible. And I kind of figured it out on my own. Uh, got a, a real estate uh, lawyer that mentored me back in the day. Mm -hmm. And... But I remember the frustration and the pain, the aggregation, aggravation and the embarrassment that I felt trying to do my first deal. I felt flat on my face. The realtors told me what I was trying to do, the technique that I had learned in the course is fraud. And, and actually the lawyer that I engaged at the time, he told me that, no, you can't do that, that's fraud. And he just simply didn't know. He didn't have creative uh, real estate experience under his belt. So again, the emphasis of the huge importance of having your power team of professionals that know exactly your business, they know the, the legal side of it, your lawyer, your accountant, your, your property manager, your mortgage broker, everybody on your team understands what you do and is all on board. And so that's why I just wanted to emphasize that point that is so important. So I appreciate you explaining and clarifying what is not mortgage fraud, okay. full disclosure. Full disclosure, that's what, that's what saves the day. Barry, what would you say is your number one tip or secret that you'd like to share with all real estate investors out there? One tip. Just one, the best. Tip or trick. I can't do it, Joel. You can't? I can't, there's too many. 10, too many. right? Ten, <laughs> at least 10, but I'll give you two. I'll give you two okay, tips. sounds good. The first tip is, it sounds kind of simple and, and people might wonder as I say it, but it's really important, it's something I do all the time, and that is something called checklists. It doesn't matter what you do, it's capable of being written down in its logical sequence, all the things that you need to do to come out with a successful conclusion at the end. It's a checklist. So. Fail to plan, plan to fail, right? Exactly, mm -hmm. that's exactly it. So I've been at it 37 years, as you said. When I buy a property, I get out my checklist and I go through the various items on the checklist. And it doesn't mean I do everything on the checklist. What it means is, is you look at everything that you ought to look at. And you might say, okay, items 10 and 11, they don't apply for this deal. Item 12, yes, we have to do it. And where this comes up is when people phone you or me and they go, Joe, Barry, I've got a problem with this deal. It's going bad. And if you sit down and talk to them and go through the sequence with them, invariably they have- Forgot something, right? They've forgotten something. They've missed a step. I couldn't agree more. In fact, in my uh, iPhone app, I put a checklist in place and took it to an another level. In engineering, we have what's called critical path, which is basically the, the shortest distance between point A and point B. So it's, it's, it's efficiency as well built into a checklist. So I've included that in my iPhone app for investors. That's a free download to, to help keep investors on check. Well, maybe if if it's an app and it'll be easier for people to use and they actually will do it. So the, the tip is always use your checklist. Absolutely. So that's number one. And the second tip involves don't be a penny pincher. Right. Don't be a penny pincher. You have to pay a little bit of money to make money. There's places to save and places not to chintz out, right? That's correct. That's correct. Don't, don't chintz out on the wedding. That's a big one. <laughs> that is a big one and I would never do that. <laughs> Different subject, but. Yeah. A different subject. So when you're buying a property, you have to find out about it and that's called diligence. You have to spend some money on diligence. You, you're better off, I think, buying a better property in a better area. And if you do that, you have to pay a little more money for it. If you do a renovation on a property, you're better off doing a decent renovation using decent contractors, which gives you a job that lasts longer before you have to redo it and gets you a better class of tenant and better rent. And as well, you need to pay for decent quality professional advice. The guys on your team, your accountant, your lawyer, your appraiser, your realtor, all those guys cost some dough and you can't cheap out on it because they're your team. Mm -hmm. So don't be a penny pincher. I totally agree. So Barry, let me ask you, what do you find in all your years of practicing law and representing thousands of real estate investors, what do you think is the number one most common legal mistake that real estate investors make? I think the top mistake that real estate investors make is that they don't understand that reading their contract is their job. They have to own that contract. 
It's not the realtor's job. They think it's your job, don't they? They think it's my <laughs> job, yes. They think it's the lawyer's job or the realtor's job, anybody but their job, to actually read that contract, every line of it, and understand it. They've got to really understand it. It's fine to read it, and if you skip over 10 clauses that you don't understand, you go, well, I read it. You need to read it, you need to understand it, and as the revisions come back, because you negotiate back and forth, you have to read the revisions, make sure they're initialed, make sure you understand them, and not leave it to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm telling you that my most successful, wealthy real estate clients are the ones who read their contracts from could, top to bottom. I couldn't agree more. I don't know if you know, but I was mentored by Volmer Nordman, who is a very wealthy real estate lawyer in BC, long retired now. And so I found that law was really core competency in, in, as a real estate investor, as I call it, core competency, something that you really have to drill down on and become an expert is what I found for my own investing because I see a lot of mistakes being made out there and, and I found that you can't, don't rely on anybody else. I mean, your lawyer's great, absolutely. The realtor does his best, uh, but we all have our limitations, right? And the contract and have a buttoned up contract is so critically important to a successful deal and career that uh, I found that it's, it's something that the, the, the successful investors drill down and become good at real estate law. And that's well. number one. In your experience, what do you think the top three critical mistakes that real estate investors make that hold them back, that stop them forever really reaching the goals that they've set for themselves? Number one is analysis paralysis. We already mm -hmm. talked about that a little bit. Action. Failure to take action, yes. Right. Failure to take action. So the second one is following the herd. Following the herd. Be and a contrarian. Be, be a contrarian. People follow the herd and of course it's not the right herd, it's the wrong herd. It's the herd that is buying properties at the top of the market when you should be maybe pulling back a little bit and going, you know, it's just a little too bubbly out there. Mm -hmm. And then as you've bought at the top of the market and the market goes down the other side. That's when your neighbor just made profit, you know, 50 grand and, and your, you know, your friend and everybody's making money in real estate and it seems that's when everybody, the masses buy, right? exactly opposite of what they should be doing. They should be selling then. They should be selling then and but when they do sell is when real estate goes into one of its cycles. They buy at the top, mm -hmm. they sell at the bottom or on the way down and they, they lose money. So it's euphoria and fear. It's following the herd when you shouldn't. It's, it's not being a contrarian when you should be. It's not paying attention to real estate fundamentals. So you have to watch following the herd because they will lead you right over the cliff. Yeah. Stick with a good or find a good coach or mentor who will get you through some of those years of learning way quicker than you could do it on your own. Yeah, they fast track your 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 success path. Well, one of my favorite Buffett quotes uh, that I always uh, encourage people to to think long and hard about it is that he says Wall Street is the only place on earth that people ride to on the Rolls Royce to get advice from people to take the subway. Case in point is, make sure whoever you're following, getting advice from, make sure they've been there, done that. Check out their pocketbook, you know, make sure that they truly are successful. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's outstanding advice. You have to be sure the person you're following is someone who knows what they're doing, mm -hmm. truly knows what they're doing. Yeah. So that was number two. And then number three uh, revolves around strategy around strategy. So there's, as you know, lots of real estate strategies. Mm -hmm. You go rich them. in your niche, right? Rich in your niche, I like it. You've got a lot of those. I like, you know, I like that. So what a lot of people do is they find a strategy that they think is their strategy and that's what they're gonna do. So they start with a particular strategy and buy some real estate and then because they're new at it, they run into a few problems and roadblocks and it isn't quite working the way they planned. And because it isn't quite working the way they planned, well, well that's not working. I, I need a new strategy. So they, ship. they jump ship, yeah. On to the next one, mm -hmm. on to the next one. Mm -hmm. And really it takes time to get good at something. But truly the gold is, lies deep, right? You gotta you got go deep to get the gold. Uh, I would say focus stands for follow one course until successful. So many people I see, like you're saying, jump ship too early. They didn't really give it enough of a shot. Yes. Right? But successful people drill deep on one particular niche, one particular area until they become successful, before they go on to the next thing. Follow one course till successful. I, I like that, focus. Follow one yeah. course until successful. So that, that's a really good way to remember that you need to take a strategy and work your way through it for a while and give it a chance to work. 
give it a chance to work. So that's the first part of a, a comment on strategy. The second one revolves around um, jumping into strategies that you're not good at yet. Senior strategies. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to buy a property uh, that you you've just rented out to a guy and he pays your rent and you've got a positive cash flow property and that's that's what you do. It's a whole other matter to start out doing joint ventures or lease options or more complicated senior strategies where you don't know what you're doing. So crawl, walk, run, right? Crawl, walk, run. You mm -hmm. have to do them in order. Uh, if you try and do them out of order, mm -hmm. whoever you're trying to work with will see through you. They'll see that you're not experienced. Mm -hmm. um, if they're silly enough to work with you, even with your inexperience, it won't go well. Mm -hmm. it, it takes time to get good at something and you really do to crawl, walk, run before you get up to those senior strategies. Mm -hmm. So start with more junior strategies and work your way up to more senior ones. Excellent advice. Thank you. <laughs>